Hello and welcome back to our study, Believe in Me, Jesus in the Gospel of John. And we are here for lesson uh, six in John 9 and 10, Jesus healing of the man born blind. And um, you will notice very often the TV behind me uh, is on today. It is dark because we have had some technical problems. And so we do have people online. We have Shirley and Sandy and my mom, Pam and Gavin online. And so our online friends should not um, see any difference in your experience. It's just that um, your sound will be coming out through my computer speakers. And so I will repeat it to the room, just like I try to repeat for the microphone, the room's comments. So for the people online, so we're just doing the repeating thing, both directions today, instead of one direction today, because we, you know, technical problems are always a specter uh, over us, right? All right, so before we get started in today's lesson, let's talk about what was meaningful to you about last week's lesson on the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda. Jesus revealed who he was. Okay, Sandy says Jesus revealed who he was. And there was that sense of like, he, he comes to the man and he says, you know, stop sinning that nothing worse will happen to you we will have so a couple of connections to this week's lesson in that right first the that finding and revealing watch for that in today's lesson and also the idea of sin and um trouble illness disability problems you know sin and trouble um jesus drew that connection so we'll watch for what the connection is this week okay what else? I was thinking about um, a lifetime of misery was changed upon contact with Jesus and upon his faith. Uh, kind of a metaphor for anyone today who has had whatever in their past can be changed significantly through faith in Jesus. Yeah. This man had a, a disabling illness of some kind. And he was changed for 38 years. He had been in that case and, and contact with Jesus is what made all the difference. And so that idea of how can we allow Jesus to change us? And we saw how that man, he didn't answer, do you want to get well? But he did obey. He obeyed Jesus' instructions. He was made well, and he continued in that wellness. And Jesus said, let your spiritual transformation match your physical transformation. Yeah, we saw that. What else? I noticed also they were talking about um, how Jesus left him immediately after it happened. And then when he saw him in the temple, they realized who it was. So okay. That's very, very interesting. What was that? Back, who said that? Or Gavin? It was me. Oh. Uh, well, I heard Shirley, but then somebody else said something. Okay. So Shirley said um, he found him in the temple. So Jesus left him immediately and then found him again in the temple. We talked about the meaningfulness of being in the temple, didn't we? Um, yeah, so definitely that. And then Mary said um, doing his father's work. So we, there was a really strong theme of what is God's work? How is it that God is working on the Sabbath? And we talked about how God is sustaining the world, holding us together when we wouldn't fall apart from the effects of sin and death, and also doing the work of life and death on the Sabbath. And Jesus made the claim that was much greater than what the rabbis would claim. He said, everything I'm doing is, is my father's work. It is the same work as my father does. And so that sustaining the world, healing was an extension of the life and death work that God does on the Sabbath. And the Jews were very upset about this. They could tell that Jesus was going much farther in his claim than they would have gone, right? And so that sort of kicked off um, their uh, persecution, or, and we can even use that word for prosecution of Jesus. So that through the rest of John, we see Jesus is essentially on trial. Yeah, what else? Jesus always gave God the glory, regardless of what he was doing. 
Okay, Sandy said, Jesus uh, always gave glory, God the glory, no matter what um, he was doing. And we talked about that mutual glory where um, glory means to show the truth of who God is, the weight of God's goodness, the shining truth of God's goodness. And so Jesus is always doing that. And God in turn glorifies the sun. And so they continue to glorify each other. Um, Janelle, please repeat what you said. Yes, God is always working so that we can continue to live, <laughs> so that our world continue to be held together. God is always working. So even though we have the sense of the Sabbath, um, where work stops, we know that we can stop work because God is continuing to reign in God's wisdom, right? Our, our Sabbath is a result of God's goodness in that way. Yeah, great point. Anyone else online with a, a thought? How about in the room? <laughs> that, way, that way I can hear everybody. Anyone else, something um, that stood out to you? Well, um, I think we've covered everything that I had listed as well. Um, we did talk about one more thing, I guess. Uh, I turned the page and discovered I had one more note. Jesus resisted the publicity campaign that his brother suggested, didn't he? Jesus did not want to go be a public figure, right? He went in secret. It wasn't about appearances. It wasn't about glorifying himself. Instead, he wanted to glorify God and God would glorify him. And so that mutuality showed through. And Jesus uh, was willing to go uh, in 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 um, in secret, in possibly in disguise. We talked about how we didn't really know what that meant, but maybe he wasn't wearing the robes of the rabbi, and that's why they didn't know. And they didn't know who he was until he said, "I'm the one that made that man well on the Sabbath." And so, God, the work of God in Jesus is what tells us. Who Jesus is. You know, he continues to point out that his works testify to his identity. Yeah. Other thoughts? I had one more thing from last time, Deanna, and that uh, Jesus, he heard alone. He didn't need gadgets or anything. He used his words to heal. Yes, that arise, that same word that we see with being raised from the dead. Jesus healed with his word alone, Sandy said. And so that, that happened. And today we'll see something a little different. We know Jesus' words are sufficient, but he does something different today. And so why does he do that, you know, is something to think about as we read. Well, let's get into our passage from this week. So we have skipped ahead a little, right? We're at the beginning of chapter 9, and there are some sections in between. In the intervening verses, Jesus has taught extensively in the temple, and there's long sections of Jesus' word. He has cried out, I am the light of the world, in 8.12, which is the second of Jesus' um, seven I am metaphor statements. I am the bread of life. I am the um, light of the world. And then concluded a long argument with the Pharisees with, uh, or the religious leaders with, before Abraham was born, I am. This is the third of Jesus' simple I am statements. He has a set of seven of each, right? The Jews know that this is a claim that Jesus is one with the father and they pick up stones for stone and they say this is blasphemy punishable by death and so they think they're going to stone him but he hides himself and goes out of the temple and that concludes a long temple discourse and that is our opening for where we're going to pick up today so would someone please read john 9 1 through 12 as he walked along he saw a man blind from birth disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. 
we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back to able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am he. And they kept asking him then, How were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. I do not know. Okay, thank you. Thanks for reading that. Okay, um, so Jesus is outside the temple, and they see this man who is blind from birth, and maybe they know he's blind from birth because the whole this is just known in the community. Um, but what is, in verse 2, what is the disciples' question? What do they assume about this man? Somebody sinned. Either him Somebody or sinned. Friends. Yeah, this, they connect, um, they assume that physical brokenness in this man must somehow be caused by sin. Why would they think that? For a long time, you know, God was, a punishment that would be I'm punishing you and your descendants for X number of generations. So I would think it would be kind of commonplace that if somebody had sinned, it would be passed on. There, there is so, um, all the so those curses, as so, um, Pam is talking about kind of the curses and blessings for obey obedience, right? Now, those curses and blessings were corporate. Right, so the people of Israel are experiencing the the negative consequences of their sin even to this day because they went into exile, their first temple was destroyed. They're back from exile, but they're not, I mean, they're under the thumb of the Romans. Like from the time they went into exile, they really haven't had any, ex they had a little brief period with the Maccabees, but they haven't been really the free nation. They've never gotten back to the glory days of Saul, David, Solomon that we remember from so long ago, right? And so they are under a consequence from sin. God does, God said he would do that and he did do it. And so they're living it, this idea that this uh, the hardship is caused by sin. The thing about those curses and blessings is that they were corporate. They were for the whole people. They were not necessarily for individuals. Now, some <coughs> individuals, you know, David had some personal uh, consequence for his own sin. You know, we see that in some stories. But in general, what we have is the sense that, yes, the brokenness of the world comes from sin, but it isn't always so simple, right? We we know that in our lives, right? You things go badly, and we cannot pinpoint sometimes who sinned <laughs> that this thing would happen. And that wouldn't it be so much simpler if we could? Um, that isn't how sin and death work in the world. Instead, um, a Christian understanding of um, the brokenness of the world is that it is caused by sin, but not that each item can be specifically tied to a sin, right? And sometimes it can. Sometimes we, I sin and it hurts somebody and I can see it. Or someone hurts me and I can see it. But very often things happen, especially in terms of illness or um, uh acts of God, uh, whether, uh, you know, we see this where it just, we just can't relate it to a single sin, can we? And so what does Jesus say about this man and the cause of his sin? Neither of them sinned, right? 
sin is is loose and, and so there is brokenness in the world and yet it wasn't caused by this man or his parents carrie you had a comment i was just thinking back it, it, it's um uh, the people before science before medicine and so many other things where we understand how an illness happened by you know dna or by whatever you know was uh, something a germ or whatever it might be people were grasping at how to explain a tragedy like this you know and i think you also get elements of, of greek and roman philosophy that come into some of this because these were not all necessarily um you know jewish people or they might have been influenced by other philosophies so i'm just thinking that there could be lots of things going on beside the concept of sin right but it's just a way of explaining how something happened yeah and i think so we do we get uh, probably the very Jewish conception from the disciples and from the leaders in this. But when we get into, um, say, the epistles, you know, we get some of the different philosophies and how that, yeah. Yeah. Other yeah. The, the, thought, the day. Yeah, the thoughts of the day. Yeah. So what does Jesus say? So Jesus says, uh, it wasn't from sin, but it is for something right he shifts from the cause of the blindness to what he can do with it what does he say he can do with it glorify god, glorify god. so there is uh, a way that god takes now does that mean god was like hmm, let's make this guy blind so i can do something good with it later what do you all think <laughs> I, I no i see head, i see heads shaking now i think they're kind of two separate statements really He's addressing what they said about sin, but then he's kind of going on to my healing him yeah. is so that God can be glorified. Not that God would make him blind so that I could come down the road later and do this thing, but yeah. these are kind of like two different things. And I'm not even sure that the punctuation here is accurate um, in that, you know, this is kind of like this continued statement with a comma, but it could very well be a completely separate statement those are all the works of translators so they yes they have punctuation yeah yeah <laughs> so well, i think that there's not like that yeah exactly so i'm thinking that this could be you know he's, he's addressing that one thing but then he's moving on to a different concept yeah well and related concepts but not just not cause and effect like yeah i think you you've made a good point what else i someone else mary were you going to say something okay yeah. Well, it, it's an encouraging statement if you think, I mean, I'm physically healthy, but sometimes I see these soldiers that come back and they're like quadriplegic, and I feel like they could just, you know, go into despair. But if you look at this, and it's sort of like, what kind of glory can come out of something bad? I just feel like that would be a, if I were ever in that position, it would latch onto that verse, I feel like, because I could just apply to it. You know, anybody going through a hard time or bad things that happen, there's some way that God can be glorified. Yeah. That. Great point. Great point. So I think, yeah, um, you've carried said it well, and that these are a little bit separate, right? Sin and death corrode our world. God holds it together and allows allows sin to exist. Why would God do that? To give us time to come to God, to allow free will in the world. You know, like this, the, the world that is corrupted by sin is allowed to continue so that God has time to draw us to him. And God takes these terrible things um, and makes good out of them. And Jesus talks about that. Yeah. Well, um, so Jesus says, that, but that God may be glorified. And then what does he say must be done? Verse four, what does he say next? As long as in the day we must do the work of him who sent me. Okay. So he's still do, talking about doing God's work. Still talking about doing God's work, right? Which he's been talking about since 517 when right. he says God is always working, right? But there's something new in this statement. What's new in this statement? It has to be done in the day. Okay. 
so Mary said night is coming. Sandy said it has to be done in the day. This is okay. It's a couple of there's a couple of things in here and that's one of them. This is like a mini parable that he kind of just works into his statement. What does he mean by working while it's still day? What is day and what is night here? What's Jesus talking about? Okay, his, Chris said it's physical presence with us. And so uh, the, in this little metaphor, which True to John does not, you can't take the metaphors and apply them and just make them bigger and apply them all over, right? They, they don't just um, cut and paste everywhere, right? In this one, his earthly ministry is day. And so what is night? His death, the cross, the resurrection. Now, does that mean it's after the cross and the resurrection? Are we just stuck in the night? That's what, no, because Jesus is alive. Okay, so that's what I mean by we can't just cut and paste it, uh, expand it out, right? It's not that this is the night now. This is our day because Jesus brings us light and he has given us the spirit of Jesus Christ. And so we have a day as well. And so we don't just take that and go, oh, I guess it's night now. Um, it That idea of doing the ministry while he has the opportunity. Chris, go ahead. Isn't this perhaps one of the first times that he tells his disciples that he's not always going to be with them? But they just, they don't get it though. They don't get it at all. It's pretty much even to us at this point. Yes, it's a little bit um, subtle. It's a little subtle or uh, cryptic, maybe. Um, I'm, I'm, I've started preparing for next week's lesson, and there's a, a, a line in it that my commentary describes as a riddle. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, okay, well, this is sort of a little bit of riddle-ish as well in that um, they, don't, they probably don't know exactly what the night that's coming is, and yet... We as readers, right? Remember, John is always playing off that idea of what the characters know versus what the reader, the audience knows, right? And so in the grand play of the, uh, in the theater of John, we go, ah, oh, night is coming. We know. Yeah, a little foreshadowing, a little bit. And so the disciples are starting to get some Jesus is giving them some warning. Yes, they don't understand it. Go ahead, Sharon. And, and then by he tries to really explain it to them. He says, "Now I will tell you the truth. I am the light of the world." He's I, trying to yeah really tell them. It you know while I'm here, we have to do this work because I'm. Okay, so two things in there. So first, Sharon pointed out, he tries to explain them, I am the light of the world. It's the repeat of the statement that he had made in um, 8.12, um, I am the light of the world, which he did in the temple just below the, um, the giant lampstands that are shining out, you know, the temple lampstands are providing this light over the city and Jesus says I am the light of the world and so he's repeating that here as he's about to do something right he's connecting I am the light of the world with the very thing he's about to do but also you point out he said we right that's new here he in 517, he said, I am always working because my father's always working. Here, who's working? All of us. Yeah, the disciples, we who are the disciples to follow, like we do the work of God. And so the idea that we would join Jesus in his work begins to be incorporated here and going forward, right? Being the light of the world. Well, let's see what it is he's about to do. Verse six, what method does Jesus employ here? He spits on the ground. He spits. And mixes it with mud and it, tells him to put it on his eyes. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, whoa, right? He spits on the ground, makes the mud and smears it on the man's eyes. Like, this does not <laughs> seem hygienic to us, does it? I'm <laughs> getting some <laughs> ooh faces in the room. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, yes, this is weird to us, especially the spitting part. But it would not have been weird to them. Um, ancient for ancient healers, saliva, especially saliva while fasting, was thought to have healing properties, and so they would use spit as part of, like, just normally ancient healers would use spit as part of their process. And we see this. There's two places in Mark where. Jesus spits too, Mark 7, 33 and 8, 22 through 25, if you're interested in more spitting. Um, yeah, but so it was a common thing to do to include spit. Um, and in fact, the Talmud, which is, um, the Talmud is a collection of Jewish rabbinic teachings that sort of form commentary on the Hebrew scriptures, but Jews in this period considered it authoritative. Um, the Talmud, in some rabbis specifically forbade healing eyes with spit on the Sabbath. Like, and Jesus does it, right? <laughs> what else? Okay, so spit is gross enough. What else? Dirt. 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 <laughs> this is new meaning to ah, rub some dirt on it, you know? <laughs> like, um, Jesus uses the dirt. What does he make? Mud or clay? What does this remind us of? What's that? I don't know if it's about potter and clay or something. Potter, yes, the potter. Right. Okay. Who in in uh, in that statement? I am the clay, and you are the potter. Who's you? In you're the clay. God is the potter. Okay. This is a take on creation, right? From the dust of the earth, God made man. And so we see this similarity to God taking the dust of the earth and making man, the original creation, in Jesus' action. It's a recreation. It's a new creation of eyes and light for this man. I have this beautiful quote from Irenaeus. Um, if you were in our history class, you may remember Irenaeus, who wrote at the end of the second century. It was one of the church fathers. A lot of really good material. He proposed, this is um, from my commentary. Um, he proposed that the work of God is displayed in these actions of Jesus. And it was nothing less than the fashioning of man in the beginning, by which the Lord took clay from the earth and formed man. For what the word, capitalized, the word, um, the word had omitted to form in the womb, that is the man's eyes, he supplied in public so that the works of God might be manifested in him. This, I, you know, we see it from our reader perspective, the formation of the man. Okay, so not only was healing both saliva for, uh, forbidden on the Sabbath, but the action of kneading, the action of taking liquid and mixing it with solid to make a thing, which you would normally then make bread, not mud, right? But kneading was also forbidden on the Sabbath. And um, in verse 14 later, we get the kind of the clue that they didn't like the kneading action as far as Jesus's um, behavior on the Sabbath. And then what is the man supposed to do once his eyes are covered with spit and dirt? He's supposed to go wash in the pool. That means what? Scent. Boy, John is really loading us up with symbolism here. What is the washing in the pool like? Baptism. Yeah, it's like a baptism, right? This man is going to be born anew with new eyes through this washing of water. And saloa means scent right it's just as the and it this name so this name Siloam um it, it's un 
certain that Siloam actually translates to scent, but that name was associated with Siloam in ancient times because that water um, is conducted from a spring through Hezekiah's tunnel. And if some of you I know have been to Israel and Hezekiah's tunnel is a, is a site you can see, um, you can go visit. So that is, you know, an interesting little bit if you are ever in Jerusalem that it, so the water is sent. What else is sent? Bread. The man, he is sent to wash and Jesus is sent from the father. So we have this, this sort of stacking of symbolism all the way through this healing. Jesus has layered it up and John has really given it to us. What's the reaction of the neighbors? <laughs> so neighborly. Skepticism. They're skeptical of what? What do they start out being skeptical of? Right. That maybe they are not able to be skeptical that the man can see. Like maybe it's too obvious that he can see. And so they're skeptical that this could even be the same man. It makes us wonder, did all they ever see about this man was his blindness? Was his disability his only identity to them until this point? That they can't even be sure it's him once he can see? Right? Let's, I just think, oh, let's look at people for who they are, right? And not the trouble they have encountered, right? And they want to know the details, right? But they, we can't really tell why they want to know the details and what they're going to do with the details, right? And so the identity of this man is questioned, and it's almost like it's, it's just a parallel, to how they question, to how the book is presenting the question, who is Jesus? What is Jesus' identity as well? Well, shall we read 9 through th uh, 13 through 23? Any other comments on that section? I was just thinking, Go ahead. they're asking like the method, he, he does include the whole, the mud and the washing, almost like, could we just do that? You know, like, we follow that process. <laughs> is it a recipe? Jesus, it does not. It does not work. Like, we can't just follow right. some sort of process that yeah. we get without Jesus. I don't know. That just struck me. Like, yeah. Like, they ask, like, well, it, it's such a great point because it's not a magic spell. Right. A magic spell, you follow like a recipe and you're supposed to get an outcome. But that is not the case here. It is the application of the power of the word of life that makes the difference. I wonder right. if somebody tried to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, yeah. You know. yeah. 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 There's one other thing. The answer, first of all, says, I don't know. He's asked, where is Jesus now? And he says, I don't know. Yeah, why doesn't he know? Because Jesus well, is always slipping away. <laughs> he's told him to go somewhere else, and he left where he had been. Yeah. And he did that also earlier. Yes. You know, he, he's, as you said, in disguise. Or unpredictable. Maybe. Too. Yeah. Or not yeah. Jesus. So Sharon stuff. says Jesus is always slipping away. Um, Chris points out he did that before. You know, he slipped away when the man at the pool of Bethesda is healed. This man, in particular, he goes somewhere with mud on his eyes. Right. He's somewhere else when he first is able to see. So he has never actually laid functioning eyes on Jesus. He has never seen him, does not know so he where he know is. Him if he was he right wouldn't there. know him. He wouldn't, right? And hmm, interesting point for our continued question of who is Jesus, right? Yeah, okay, someone read um, 13 through 23, please. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. 
But the others ask, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. But the Jews still said, still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? Uh, uh, 23. Do we finish okay. through 23? Go he ahead. He knew. We know he is our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Thank you. Okay, what do you all notice about this section? What stands out to you? Some of them didn't even believe he was blind to begin with. Okay, Sandy says some of them, some of them didn't even be believe he was blind to begin with. So there is this sense of like, is he the same man? Was he blind to begin with? Okay, what else? His parents come through in order to Okay. <laughs> There's a little bit of passing of the buck here, right? The parents didn't want to answer. Why didn't they want to answer? Well, they didn't want to get thrown out of the synagogue. Okay. So uh, Sharon says they did not want to get thrown out of the synagogue. So let's look at the environment here, right? The, first of all, you notice the neighbors are like, let's march him over to the Pharisees, right? Like, what is their deal that they have to, like, report, you know, in um, on this man? Um, but when they do... The Pharisees begin to interview him. What kind of atmosphere are they in? It's that courtroom atmosphere, isn't it? This is like a judicial environment. They want to hear his testimony. And you can tell they feel they are owed his report, right? They are owed his testimony, and it's their job to make a judgment in their view from the way that this reads. Right, and, and what is kind of their, what's their judgment? Well, they want to know how he can see. Was he really born blind? They're questioning everything. They, every step of the chain they're questioning. And some think, oh, he must be bad. And others, he must be good right? Some say he can't be from God for he doesn't keep the Sabbath, right? The same issue coming up again and others. Ah, but would God listen to someone who performs such signs? How could a sinner perform such signs? This idea that Jesus works are supposed to point to whether or not Jesus is from God. And it's not only is it a judicial environment, um, but it's a fraught environment, right? This is, it is a dangerous environment. Um, anyone might be put out of synagogue who confessed Jesus as the Messiah. This would have really hit home for John's first readers because we know historically during the time John is writing, this very thing was going on between Jews um, and Jewish followers of Jesus becoming, you know, we would say Christians, you know, the, those terms take a while to fully develop. Um, so Jews and Jewish Christians are clashing and people are being put out of the synagogue. And so we see this very thing in this story. And the parents, you know, I think about these parents. They have suffered under the assessment that they must have sinned or their baby must have sinned for this terrible thing to happen. So not only do they have... You know, there there were no, there were not the kind of supports, uh, functional supports maybe for blindness that we have now. Although they did have tight knit communities, but then their community thinks they sent. They were fearful. 
Yeah, they have lived with this their whole life. I just think, oh, I wish they could have had the opportunity to just truly rejoice in this restoration. Instead, they're under fear of being put out of the synagogue. Chris? Not only was it a fraught political situation, it was a fraught religious situation also. Because the Jews were considered to be Okay, say more about that. Because they could have been kicked out of their faith, you know, their collective faith. Yeah. Because of it. Okay, so Chris points out it's both religiously fraught, they could be kicked out of their faith, and politically fraught because if people start using the synagogue as a basis for Messiah claiming, then that becomes a movement that can be violent and dangerous and can get them in trouble with Rome. So there's always that in the background as well. Okay, let's do uh, 24 through, through, how are we on time? Okay, 24. So a second time they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. What do they mean by give glory to God? Confess, Confess right? Give glory to God is an idiom. It's a, a, a I would say Hebrew, but I think Aramaic probably. Um, uh, idiom for tell the truth um because because god's glory is the shining truth of god's nature so it all makes sense right but they just use it as expression tell the truth right he then answered man born blind verse 25 whether he's a sinner i do not know one thing i do know that though i was blind now i see doesn't this read like so many of the passages we saw in Isaiah when we did our Isaiah study? The blind shall see. Um, and he is proclaiming that messianic promise has been fulfilled in him. Verse 26. So they said to him, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? Little sassy, right? He is spicy with the leaders. They reviled him and said, you are his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know God has spoken for, to Moses, but for this man, we don't know where he's from. The man answered and said, oh, he gets spicier. Well, here is an amazing thing. You don't know where he's from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if ever, anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sin. And are you lecturing us? And so they put him out. Okay, what do y'all notice? What do you think? Start throwing them out. Yes, yes, this did happen. In, yes, this idea of like the, that division, right? And there's division between the leaders. There's division between the followers. There was division in the time of the first readers. And so all of that is echoing through here. Yes, what else? I mean, he's standing up to them, but then they just, all they can do is kind of this, like, attack fast about, you're a sinner. Yeah. Like, we don't matter. We don't care. Like, what you say doesn't matter. Yeah. Just reminding him of that. And I feel like they know that's not true. <laughs> well, well, okay. So this section is, like, bracketed between with reference to, to this man's blindness being from sin, open and close, right? And the thing that we get in the closing version is I think they really did believe that the blindness was caused by sin. That was very entrenched in their belief system. But is he blind now? So if he was, if he had sinned and blindness, why is it that he 
he can see now. I mean, right. Right. So if and he confess of a made up sin. <laughs> <laughs> well, just this like if he if his blindness were caused by sin and he is now not blind, then hasn't his sin been forgiven and hasn't he been restored? Hasn't he been made new? His eyes have been made new. So isn't he made new in terms of his spiritual self as well, right? They completely ignore his restoration. And they do actually kick him out. His parents may have saved their place in the synagogue, but this man did not. Why? Why? What's the, what's the worst thing he did? Confess Jesus. <laughs> Go ahead, Sandy. I just said he confessed that Jesus had, had healed. Jesus had healed him, and he said, I'm Jesus. Disciple. Disciple. Right. We have the marks of the true disciple here. He's confessing Jesus. This is his testimony. Right. And so this man is now a disciple of Jesus. And notice the progression. The more he talks, the surer he gets of Jesus. Right. He starts out. He's like, well, he's a prophet. And now I'm his disciple. And let's see how far it goes. Um, <laughs> yeah okay is it like their accusations built his confidence i think that's a good starting point what else might have built his confidence well the realization that this man did heal me his he, testimony he yes. yes he has testified to himself yes. Yes. with his testimony of what happened to him you know it's become like sharon said the realization of what has happened to him right so this idea like as we testify about jesus as we say it aloud as we talk to people and tell what jesus has done for us it builds our own faith too right we are made more into jesus disciples as we tell what jesus has done for us and this has happened to this man someone read for us um the very last little section here well actually yeah, just 35 through 40 someone read 35 through 40. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so I may believe in him. And Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and they said, what? Are we blind too? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Okay. All right. A couple of things here, right? Like, um... Jesus had slipped away, so what does he do now? Finds him, right? Jesus goes and finds this man, just like he did with the man from the pool of Bethesda, right? And what's the challenge? Again, there's a challenge, right? What's the challenge this time? Do you believe? Do you believe, right? And the man has never seen Jesus. So he, Jesus has to do this reveal again. I'm the one speaking to you. Um, what does the man do to accompany his statement of belief? Worship. He worships Jesus. What a key point. We know he calls him Lord um, and he worships him. And we know that only God can rightly receive worship. And so worshiping Jesus is akin to saying you are one with God. This is a huge progression in the man's belief, and it's a huge step for the reader, right? The reader goes, oh, worships him. Wow, that is something. And so this man is receiving worship. We understand he is with God and is God, as we heard in the very opening statement of the book, right? I think he Go ahead, Sandy. I was just going to say, I think he 
realizes now that God is in charge of his life and not the leaders of the temple. Okay. Okay. And maybe he's, maybe he is okay with being thrown out or at least uh, he's excited about what's next because now he has his understanding of Jesus and his new sight, his new birth into the light to continue to carry him through. And, you know, I kind of thought they were having a private conversation, but are they having a private conversation? It, like it does sound that way. Why? Well, because they heard, they heard them. They heard what they said. Yeah, the Pharisees who were with them heard these things. What do the Pharisees think? They're blind. They're blind. Yeah. What'd you say, Sharon? They're, they're kind of baffled because they ask, are we blind too? Are we blind too? <laughs> baffled or insulted or some combination thereof, right? Okay. So um, Jesus says, for judgment, I have come into the world. Now, I think that's a statement that we can find a little alarming, um, especially as Jesus makes it over and over in John. But we notice that the result of his judgment is that those who follow Jesus get to follow Jesus. That's the judgment here, right? So his judgment on the Pharisees is that they claim to see and end up being blind, right? That reversal. Go ahead, Sharon. So I can see in 41, Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But the Jews felt the blindness came from sin. Yes. And then he tells them, but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Right. So what are they guilty of? Well, for one thing, they're, they're guilty of not believing that Jesus is who he's saying he is. Okay. He's standing right in front of them. Right there. He, they know he did the miracle they it's their refusal to believe in him that is their guilt, right? Their guilt is in their uh, turning away from the light of the world who is right there in front of them. And that's what he's calling blindness. If the light of the world is standing in front of you and you go, no, nope, must be a sinner, must, can't, couldn't possibly be. That's blindness, and he's equating blindness and sin because of their blind decision, right? Their decision is their blindness, and that's what he's calling sin, turning away from Jesus. And what does that tell us for ourselves? How would, how would you apply this to your own self? We need to see where we may be blind. Let's, Chris says, we need to see where we may be blind. You know, the people who are the religious insiders, they don't always have it right. Big news flash in the scriptures here, right? As religious insiders, which, you know, here we are at the Bible study, right? But we don't always have it right. And we have to listen to Jesus. We have to constantly be willing to humble ourselves, to listen and say, I may not have everything right. I may be in the dark. And when I'm in the dark, that's the very time that I can't see. It's only Jesus that opens my eyes and enables me to see the right way when I'm in the wrong. And so that humility is completely lacking in the Pharisees here. And sometimes I think we can we can find ourselves in the same position. Go ahead, Chris. I believe it was Elijah cured someone of leprosy. Ah, <laughs> Naaman, yeah. Elisha, who said, "Paid the servant and got you know, someone else wound up with leprosy." <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And in this case, <coughs> these Pharisees ought to be glad that they still had the use of their physical eyes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a great that's point. I love that. Okay, uh, uh, Chris is referring to a story of Elisha, who um, 
uh, a, a foreign person, Naaman, has leprosy and comes to him to be healed. And he's told, Elisha tells him to go wash in the Jordan. And he's like, that's a dirty river. I'm not washing in that river. And the servant's like, well, I mean, if he told you to do some heroic work, you would do it. Can't you just try, you know, so he goes, he, he humbles himself to obeying and is healed. He washes just as this man went and washed and was healed. He goes and washes and is healed. And then he wants to give, uh, he wants to give a thank you gift. The thank you gift is declined, right? The prophet de declines the thank you gift and the servant's like, I'll take that thank you gift. Um, it's and the servant and after Elisha said, no, God forbid that I would take a gift for the work God has done. And so the servant goes and says, I want the gift and gets it and does in fact end up with leprosy. And I don't, I think, I think the ancient reader would also maybe notice but with the washing to be healed. I think that that might, um, sound familiar to the ancient reader as well. Yeah. And so Chris said they should just be thankful they still have the use of their eyes because the same thing could have happened to them as to the servant. Yeah. yeah, yeah great point. Go ahead. Is this blind man a metaphor for those being born blind to the faith, to Jesus? And we're talking about Jews who were born into Judaism and yet blind not seeing the coming of the Christ. Yeah, yeah. Huge metaphor. Definitely, and, and Jesus makes it, right? So de yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's exactly you, exactly what Jesus is saying. You're the very people to whom the word has God has come. You should know this and not knowing it is a sinful level of not seeing. You're in the dark, you're blind. It's a caution to those of us who are born into a Christian family today we any all of us can become complacent in our faith mm -hmm. right linda says it's a caution to those who are born into a christian family and i would extend it to anyone like when we start to become religious insiders you know then we still have to be humble enough to 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 see where jesus has you know we wouldn't say we're done and fixed and perfect and yeah. complete in our growth in Christ, would we? And so where does Jesus have um, something to show us? Yeah. And we have our blind spots, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the things that have um, based on a tradition that we've grown up with or our own prejudices, yeah. that there are portions of, of the Bible of the faith that we embrace and others that we don't embrace um, and mm -hmm. things that we allow our own opinions to overtake us. Yeah. And just basically your own blind spots. Yeah, definitely. And I think the prayer is, Jesus, open my eyes. Yeah. Great point. Okay, well, um, so there's something else um, interesting happening here, just kind of on a, on a sort of a literary level. So um, in Jewish society, False prosecution is a very serious offense, right? Ten Commandments, what does it say? False, do not give false witness, right? Um, or false testimony. And so anytime and someone was under prosecution and they believed that a false um, witness had been given against them, they could initiate what was called a reverse prosecution and prosecute back. And this is a part of Jewish courts and a very serious you know, taken very seriously, right? And so what we're seeing here is following this pattern of a reverse prosecution that Jesus is now initiating against the leaders that were prosecuting him. So just as he is under attack in this courtroom style um, ongoing argument with them, uh, not always in the same room, right? It continues chapter after chapter and in these different locations, but they are, he is under prosecution. And now he is saying, you are also under prosecution for the falseness of your charge 
against me that I am not from God. And so a reverse prosecution, so prosecution and reverse prosecution will continue to thread through the rest of the book. Okay, um, chapter 10. Truly, truly, or amen, amen, I say to you, who does not, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper comes, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee to them from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what of these things were which he had been saying to them. Okay. Has Jesus changed the subject? He said to the Pharisees, you were blind. And suddenly he says, whoever doesn't enter by the door is a, a thief and a robber, not the shepherd, right? This seems to us like an abrupt change of subject. <laughs> Jesus has gone from this conversation, this reverse prosecution of the Pharisees, and now he's talking about shepherds, right? But um, if this, who in Israel was a shepherd? In Israel's history, who was a shepherd? David. David? Who else? The leaders. The leaders. Okay. Moses was a shepherd. David David was a shepherd when Samuel first anointed to him. He used a shepherd's uh, approach when fighting Goliath. He was called a shepherd. I gave you some passages to read. But I also gave you a passage out of Ezekiel 34. And there's a similar one in Jeremiah um, 23. And that passage, if you read it, it says, somebody give us a one sentence summary of that, of Ezekiel 34, if you have read it previously. So, so the shepherds were not taking care of the flock. Okay. He, God says in Ezekiel 34, you leaders of Israel, you're like bad shepherds who weren't taking care of the flocks, it right? It's like a, a job description. Okay. Okay, the, the, the leaders of Israel were supposed to be good shepherds. That's their job description, as Linda says. And then they were doing very badly at it. They were failing at that job of shepherding. And so Jesus has not changed the subject, right? That's interesting, isn't it? Like you, Pharisees, you're the leaders. You claim to see, but you're blind. Your sin remains. You're bad shepherds right jesus is the shepherd who enters by the door but they are the thieves and the robbers aren't they so it this is a, a metaphor of indictment against the bad shepherds of israel what else does jesus say in here we get some i am statements right what are his i am statements well, actually, I didn't read that. Let, let's read a little further. So Jesus said to them again, Amen, amen. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear him. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that may, they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd and not the owner of the sheep sees the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand. He's not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, even as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with the shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. 
this commandment I received from my father. And a division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and this is insane. Why do you listen to him? And others were saying, these are not the sayings of demon possessed. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So we see we have not left the subject of the healing. We've, we've brought it, this all part of the same section, isn't it? Right? So what is what else does Jesus say in that section? He's willing to lay down his life, but they're not. Yeah, they're not. He is. That's what makes him a good shepherd. He said, this is what defines me as a good shepherd, that I lay down my life from the sheep. So we're pulling on those Isaiah passages again, aren't we? Especially 53. Um, the, the religious leaders are more like the hired hands. He's kind of taking their place, just like he takes the place of the physical temple. Okay. He, he is the new leadership of the people of Israel, the one who is good and right and uh, cares enough, right? The hired hand doesn't care, but he cares enough to lay down his life from the sheep, and he has power enough to take it up, take his life up again. We notice Jesus had found the man, just as a shepherd finds a lost sheep. And so we see the goodness of the good shepherd as God promised in Ezekiel 34. If we read that whole passage, God promised to come and shepherd the people himself when the shepherds of Israel failed. In, in stories, we've already said, you have a woman at the well and a, uh, the man who was lame. When they heard Jesus' voice, they knew they were listening to the Son. Okay. And, and the, the leaders don't hear Jesus' voice. Okay. So there's a so Linda points out that there's a there's a point here also about the sheep, right? Who's a true sheep? Because who hears the shepherd's voice and follows? Only the true sheep. The man heard Jesus' voice and followed. The leaders did not decide to follow Jesus. They do not know Jesus' voice. And so that element of true sheep or disciple, you know, we saw it. And Linda points out that we've seen this in the previous story. Who is a true disciple? Those who follow the true shepherd. Those are the true disciples. Well, we have seen that this man who is blind now sees and discovers the identity of Jesus. Um, and Jesus, through whom all things were created, creates a new light sight for this man from the dust of the earth. He's brought light out of darkness in the restoration of his eyes, but also in the connection of this man with himself, right? The light of the world. And now they are together follower and Lord. And these opening and closing mentions of the man's brightness, uh, blindness sort of call the question of, well, who is under judgment for sin? And the choice of whether you're under judgment from sin is all about whether or not you accept Jesus, right? So when we are in our regular religious lives, Always, we have to come back and say, Jesus, open my eyes that I can see the right way. We always need Jesus to bring us into the light and help us see. And there are always thieves and robbers and wolves in the world, all of these sources of trouble, right? There are a lot of things that are terrible in the world, but the good shepherd is ready to take the works of sin and death and the works of evil and redeem them into the works of mercy of our good God. And so we can then join Jesus in that work, in the day that he gives us to be a part of what he is doing in the world. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for your discussion, everyone online, everyone in the room. Um, and uh, next week, we will get into Jesus' final um, culminating sign in the first half. We've, we haven't, you know, 
we haven't covered every bit of text, so we haven't counted off our signs, but this will be the seventh sign um, in the raising of Lazarus in John 11. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you for another wonderful lesson, Deanna. Um, does anyone have any announcements or any further um, prayer requests for Linda? Don't forget to sign the cards. Pam is going to take two sunshine bags to Jim and Bob today. So be sure and sign them, especially those two cards. Is he still in rehab? Okay. Here or there's no mic. There's no mic. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll project. Uh, I wanted to share with you what Leo has shared with me uh, and has asked for our prayers. She has a 93, 94-year-old aunt who was just sitting in her chair in her house reading a Bible and her hip book. And they've taken her in Corpus there.